There was an article recently, college students today don't know what folders are. The professor says, oh, go to this folder. What's a folder? A whole generation coming up now that grew up with Google. I haven't used folders on my laptop for probably 10 years. That whole paradigm is going to pass away. Anne-Laure LeCompf is the founder of Nest Labs, an ex-Google employee and a neuroscience PhD. I've written about almost 500 articles now. I don't know how you do that, but anyway, go on. And she's built a digital note system to help her publish hundreds of articles a year. In order to be so prolific in terms of writing, obviously I do need to capture a lot of information and then transform this into actual original ideas. Anne-Laure's second brain is built around two digital worlds, Rome Research and the Google Suite. Rome is a folder-free note-taking app preferred by the Gardner archetype, note-takers who connect notes on the fly, whereas Google Keep is used by the student archetype that favors ease of use and quick capture no matter where they are. For the longest time, I was using only Google products. I was a proper Google <laughs> fan girl, so I would take my notes in Google Keep, do all of my writing in Google Docs. I would even book the time that I need to write in my Google Calendar. <laughs> uh, so everything, wow. everything would happen in Google but I am a believer in specific tools for specific jobs. I think for note-taking, there's nothing in the Google ecosystem that's doing a good job enough that you would find in other tools like Rome in my case, but there's other people using Notion, Evernote. These are tools that are specifically designed for note-taking and Google hasn't built that yet. A big struggle that I have, and this is definitely a source of friction, is that I actually love good old paper books. It's something that I really enjoy and I don't want to sacrifice for more efficiency. So it means that I'm very old school with highlights. I have a pen and I will just underline whatever I think is interesting. And then I will do a little dog ear but at the bottom of the book. And I try then, whenever I'm sitting down in front of my laptop and I'm going to take notes and do a little bit of more proactive research, I will just go through all of the pages that I've read in the past day or two days and decide whether it's going to go in my note-taking system or not and I'll just type it up. Which is why very often for each book I don't end up with a lot of things that I actually import because it's pretty tedious actually. It's not fun, that's not the fun part mm -hmm. at all of note-taking. Mm -hmm. It's a good filter, I think. Using friction as a, as a friend, not all friction is inherently bad. Some things you don't want to happen faster, you don't want to have more of. So friction can be, you know, a, like a helpful constraint. Friction as a friend, I love that. So if you come across a link that you don't have time to read immediately, but you're like, I wanna to get to, to this later, do you use a dedicated program? Do you save it in Rome? What's your, what's your workflow? I save it in Rome. I actually coded my own little web clipper cool. <laughs> for Rome. It's just in the bookmark bar. Click on this and it takes the information from the link. It adds a to read tag. The reason why I like having this tag is then that I can go here in my to read category. And if I look at all of the references here, it's a reading list. It's a read later app inside of Rome because I often also add other tags to it to read and then another tag. I can also then filter things and just pull things to read about oh, a certain topic. That's cool. So you're sort of like batch processing instead of having to switch to completely different subjects. You just like doo -doo 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 -doo, one subject. What do you do once you want to prioritize it, create some sort of structure, add order and meaning, let's say, to the information that you've captured? For anyone who's been using computers, you've been taught to use folders and subfolders where everything has a specific place. Yes. And so if you want to find a note, you'll have to think about, okay, what's the highest category that this belongs to? And then I'm going to go to the correct subcategory and yes. here is my note. Right? Drill down one step at a time. Exactly. Uh -huh. What I like about Rome is that it's a lot more flexible. Once I've read something, I'm just going to add tags, which in Rome correspond to specific pages which I treat like hubs, basically. So I have a hub, for example, that's all about EEG, which is a technique that I use for my PhD. Whenever I read something about it, whenever I take notes, I'm going to add EEG to it, and then it's going to show up here. Without you having to do anything or specifically take this action, it makes it appear automatically on a page, which is just like a web page, that is titled EEG, is that right? Absolutely, and by just adding this tag, then this page is going to pull all of the notes that are linking back 
to this page. So here, for example, if you look at the linked references, you see all of the days where I randomly read stuff about EEG and I added a tag here. So they're all showing up here. There's nothing else to do for me. And it's very similar to the way my reading list is working. So you didn't have to create this page, build this page, design this page, maintain this page. All of that maintenance is kind of done for you. It's freeing up mental energy for actual creative thinking. And this is where we should spend our time and energy. A lot of people think that coming up with new ideas is about having this mystical Eureka moment, mm -hmm. this muse just whispering in your ear. A light bulb. And exactly. It turns on. <laughs> Here's your idea. Go and write about it. Yeah. <laughs> coming up with a new idea is about combinational creativity. It's about taking two existing ideas, building on the shoulders of giants and connecting them in a way that nobody has done before. I'd love to see a concrete example of this. Can you show us your process for an article that you published recently? Okay, this one about weak arguments. So let's have a look at what it looks like in Rome. But this is something that I've been reading about. I've noticed after a while, a few times where it came up in different places where I was reading articles. So if you look at the bottom here in the references, I will have those two notes that I have. One of them is from Paul Graham from a blog post where he lists a lot of different ways that people build weak arguments that look like they're strong, but they're absolutely not. And here's another one from the philosopher Daniel Dennett, where he's sharing when someone has written a weak argument and is when they use an operator such as surely. Because when you say surely, Surely, you're actually not sure and you're hoping mm. that the reader is sure. It's like, obviously, well, if it's obvious, why are you saying it? <laughs> exactly. So here I have those two ways that those two thinkers have devised to spot weak arguments. And I'm going to start working on an outline based on this. And I do it straight into that hub page here. And I have an introduction. I have a few sections. I pull here. If you look at this, I didn't retype this. This is actually automatically pulled from the reference. What do you mean when you say it was pulled into this, this page? Uh, I can drag it and I go like this and here it is. Whenever I'm ready with the outline, this is when I move on to the next step. I paste it into a Google Doc and then I work from there. So this is the Google Doc. Obviously you're seeing the final version after I've done all of the writing, but if you compare what it looks like here, it's uh, pretty similar, but also there were things that I didn't really write in the outline. So here I'm like, give one, two examples, question mark. Didn't <laughs> seem very sure I would do it or not. So I did end up adding the examples, but I made them up and wrote them on the spot while I was writing the article because that was something that was really hard to know at the outline stage, whether it would actually help and enhance the content or whether it would just feel like unnecessary fluff. This is honestly more art yes. than science. Yes. You just feel it yeah. when you're writing, whether it's helping or not, whether it flows in a way that makes sense. Another thing that I really like about Google Docs is that it plays really well with WordPress, which is the content management system that I use. So once I'm done, I just have to copy paste the draft into WordPress. And I just love how in this case, it's frictionless, no friction in the publication process. So I can publish often and get good feedback from people. The internet is just a massive co-creation project. So instead of trying to have your own perfect little article, immutable, that's going to be your legacy, I think it's way healthier and way more productive to see it as this giant playground where everyone is contributing and you're bringing your unfinished idea and saying, hey, look, this is my thing. What about your thing? Oh, what about if we bring our things together? What is going to come out of that? but it will still be a source of learning, collaboration, connection with other people. To figure out your own note-taking style, watch this video on choosing the right Second Brain app for you.